From the Oregon State University Extension Service, this is Pollination, a podcast that tells the stories of researchers, land managers, and concerned citizens making bold strides to improve the health of pollinators. I'm your host, Dr. Adoni Melithopoulos, Assistant Professor in Pollinator Health in the Department of Horticulture. An episode that I constantly think about is one we had with Dr. John Asher, where he made the bold claim that the study of native bees today is where the study of birds was in the 1970s. And at that transition point, what happened was a whole lot of people started making observations on birds and their location, people who weren't from the university. And a key dimension of kind of um, bringing all these new people into the study of birds was the bird guide. Everybody remembers the Peterson Bird Guide has a little map of where the birds are, a picture of them, and some descriptions. We lack a bird book for the bees. Until now, I'm really excited to finally have on the the show um, uh, Dr. Olivia Messenger Carroll. Now, the book that she uh, was a co-author on with uh, Dr. Joe Wilson is the most recommended book on uh, pollination, The Bees in Your Backyard. I got wind that um, uh, uh, Dr. Messenger Carroll and Dr. Wilson were working on a bird book for bees. They are going to be releasing later this year, the spring, uh, um, a kind of uh, the common bees of the eastern United States with a common bees of the western United States to follow. In this episode, you're going to hear about that initiative and the challenges associated with doing something like this. Um, We're also going to dive into the book in the second half, and we're going to describe some of the pages, which are remarkable. And so without further ado, here's Dr. Olivia Messenger Carroll, finally on the show, uh, this week on Pollination. It's been six years since The Bees in Your Backyard came out. And for me, this book's release was it really kind of marked a period where, you know, people were just starting to become like you know, a lot of people started to get aware of native bees. And I wonder, as you know, as one of the co-authors of that book and looking back and sort of having all the engagements that go along with being a co-author of The Bees in Your Backyard. Have you noticed uh, is there a change in, in terms of like public attention around native bees? Absolutely. Uh, But if I really think about it, I would say the change probably started a long time before the bees in your backyard. I don't think the two are like cause and effect in any way. Um, I think it came along at the right time, but that that change was already happening. Um, You know, I got my start studying bees when I was 19, working in sort of central California in a place called Pinnacles National Monument, which is like two to three hours from San Francisco, maybe a little more, something like that. But anyway, it's close enough that this tiny little monument got a whole lot of visitors. And here I was, this young person out with a net, a bunch of vials strapped to my body, like looking for bees and stuff. And so a lot of people would stop and want to talk to me about what I was doing. And so once we got past, you know, kind of sorting out the fact that I wasn't collecting butterflies or fish and got down to the heart of it, which is that I was looking for bees, um, the, the first thing that would happen was that people would want to talk to me about being stung. <laughs> That's where the conversation went every time. It was either they wanted to tell me about the worst thing they'd ever had, or they wanted to know when the last time I'd been stung was, um, which I get. I totally understand that because... When you don't understand something, you fall back on that personal experience. And if that's all you've got, that's what you're going to talk about. Um, But anyway, we got through the sting stories and I I would inform them a little bit more about bees. But now I'm still out in the field a lot. I'm still collecting a lot of bees and I'm still running into people and talking to them. And and the stories aren't about being stung anymore. There's still that sort of begrudging respect for the bee and the, the horrible sting that it can give you. But a lot more of it is sort of a curiosity and a concern that wasn't there before. And I think that's because their personal experience has changed to include not just that horrible, painful moment, but also maybe a story they heard on the news or a book that they've picked up and read about um, or something. I even had one guy in... Um, here in New Mexico, I was working in a national monument here, 
And he, he came up and told me that maybe I ought to check into Pinnacles National Monument and the work they'd done on bees in case it couldn't form. <laughs> but it was I so love great that. because and yeah, I did too. It was wonderful. Um, but uh, it was it was a different conversation than I used to have with people about bees. So there's definitely as as the experience as the available information for people changes, um, there's there's different conversations happening for sure. You know, I remember that as coming from a honeybee background, you used to get it was the sting conversation. But there was came this moment you could get in a taxi in Manhattan and say, I work on bees. And the person was like, oh, how are they doing? Like suddenly it was like it was like a shift. Yeah, it seemed to happen fairly fast. I'm sure it was a pretty gradual thing, but it did seem to be, um, yeah, from my point of view, a little more. I still got to work on that honeybee thing. That's what we talk about now. People still um, assume that I'm out there looking for like wild honeybees and feral colonies or something. And so I still have to educate them about how they should be proud of New Mexico and proud of the Southwest and deserts because there's so much going on here. But we're getting there. It's a trend in the right direction. <laughs> Well, I suppose, you know, that that is a really, you know, as I'm just thinking about your early experience, you know, out uh, doing very hardcore native bee survey and inventory and biodiversity work. Um, and, you know, it is a different kind of register to be able to communicate to a broad audience. And I, I wondered what prompted you in the first place to make that jump. Like that's not a lot of people do that. Um, and, you know, it's it's obviously necessary and it sort of came at a really the book came out at a real important moment what what what's motivating you to do this um this is a hard question i i think there's probably a bunch of answers probably all partially true so um i guess break it down i i am lucky enough to have in my mind a body of knowledge that not many people have but they want to have um and i i like people a lot <laughs> I know we give ourselves a bad rap and we tend to think that humans maybe aren't all that great, but I think when armed with the correct knowledge, we have the capacity to do some pretty cool things either as individuals or as communities. And um, I think the missing link there is, is the information. Um, and so as someone who cares about bees and cares about bee health and, and the future of, of our pollinators, it seems like arming people with the correct information might be a good way to get the results that I want to see so that people can make decisions based a little more in ecological reality. So yeah, number one, I guess I, I like people and I like telling them this and I, I am confident that it will be used in a good way if people know these things. Um, but I also, you know, I, 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 again, was, I'm such a fortunate person to have the background that I did and to have had mentors to learn something a little bit before most people wanted to know the things that I, I did. And um, so when I was working through like my PhD, I often and so we were really struggling to move on from like the the golden book of insects they had as a kid to like the tone that is the bees of the world. Like that's a huge jump. And there's not much really so that I could feel that I would be able to fill in. That would be kind of fun and to break it down in sort of a fun way to talk about like um you know, compound eyes converging near this or something like that, and turn that into something that instead was um, a heart-shaped face on a bee and super easy to understand, but gets the same message across seemed like kind of a fun challenge to take on. Um, and I think maybe the last thing is that I, I really love writing. I scientists write a lot, but science is very efficient and there's not a lot of room in there for, um, for expounding and, and exploring, saying something in kind of a fun way that really catches people's attention. And this book was a perfect sort of avenue for, for, for tackling that a little bit and turning the word ocracious into something a little more interesting this or whatever. Um, not to belittle those words, they're very important and very useful in keys, but uh, it was fun to, to take that scientific base and turn it into something more usable. Yeah, and I have to say the the book is really great that way. It does. I know a lot of people that that was their introduction. I w we have a podcast either either it's already aired. I don't know when this is going to come in, but Michael Laughlin, who has been working, he's going to be on an episode on Yamhill Soil and Water Conservation District where he's been doing some pollinator seedings. He was talking about for him that you know picking up that book was kind of allowed him into a world that seemed inaccessible previously. 
Yeah, and I don't think there's any reason that it should be inaccessible. Why mm -hmm. not get this knowledge out in as many different ways as possible? I mean, I'm a, I'm an educator when I'm not working on B stuff. I'm educating in other ways. And there's something about this sort of spiral learning where you come back and circle back on something in as many ways as possible. And this is just one one of many ways to learn about bees. Well. Uh, me and many other people were excited to hear that you and Dr. Wilson are embarking on the next phase. <laughs> there was a, you made a face, but the, uh, and it's, it's, uh, the face is justified. This is a big undertaking the, the co a guide to the common bees of first the Eastern and then Western bees of North America. And it's, it's a huge undertaking and it's like, it, it hasn't been done. I, I'm just what, you know, in a way that's accessible. I'm what, possessed you <laughs> where did this idea start where did it kind of oh, come out of what were we thinking it was i don't know it was a moment of weakness <laughs> um it, it, we weren't the ones possessed. I'll, I'll say that to start with. So uh, the book, The Bees in Your Backyard, had just come out. It had been out for about a week. And Princeton um, approached us and asked us if we'd be interested in oh, doing good. this. Yeah. And so um, our agent at the time called us up. Our agent, who's still our agent, same person. But he called us up and he said something about um, the book is selling like the Harry Potter of field guys. And I was like, <laughs> Sorry, that, that was good. good? <laughs> Are we, am I okay? I don't know what that means, but I think it's good. Anyway, and then they asked if we'd be interested in doing these other two. And it, I think it's a great idea. This isn't out there and it, it's, um, someone needs to try it. I don't know if we were successful, but um, what possessed us was a moment of high after hearing that our, our last book had done fairly well. Um, We'll see if it works. One of the drawbacks um, to the bees of the backyard was that it was so big. It's really hard to lug around in the field. It's hard to put in a backpack. It's hard to take out to a field site. And our hope with these other two was that maybe we can make something a little smaller that felt more like an actual field guide um, that you could tuck in your pocket and take with you, maybe be a little more useful. Yeah, you know, I guess that it, it is interesting that that's the genesis of it. And I love the Harry Potter of uh, <laughs> field guides. It is true. And I guess, I guess the uh, uh, when you you must have sat down and sort of like contemplated this. So you must have had a few. What were some of those early conversations about like some of the challenges of tackling this kind of a, a project? What, what were, yeah, just give, give me an insight to a few years okay. four years ago when you started talking about this. <laughs> Yeah, so Joe and I originally were just like, yay, we're going to do this cool thing. And then, you know, we, we sat down, had a couple of phone calls and it was like, wait, how, how, how are we going to do this? What's this going to look like? And um, we, um, Princeton asked us to give them sort of a rough draft of what a chapter might look like. And we came up with something that was really beautiful. But of course, we picked the group Anthidium, the wool carter bees, which are super easy to do. If I'd started with Lazy Glossom or something, we might have backed out right then and there. Um, but the, so the obvious challenges are one, how do you pick the most common species, right? Obviously, even for the East, which is doesn't have it only has what a third, I guess, of the species that you find in the West, roughly speaking, Western states. Um, how do you pick from those almost 800 species, the ones to include in a book so that it doesn't turn into something you can't take into the field? Um, especially when you consider that like the bees that you would see in Pennsylvania are completely different yeah. from the common bees in Florida. So how do you address that? Um, in the end, what we decided was to go with a lot of bees that are fairly common in more urban environments, knowing that those would be the bees seen by the most people. And then we included some specialist bees where you could sort of be like, I'm looking at an Ipame or I'm looking at hibiscus. And so, you know, the most likely bee might oh, be something good. like this. And then um, the other thing was how to take that language, that really technical, difficult language and turn it into something that could be understood by someone who is still just getting getting started. I mean, I've been looking at bees for a long time and sometimes I still have to go back like, wait, what is what is that thing again? Um, so putting in enough of sort of the background information about bee identification and then lots and lots of pictures so that people could look at where the arrows are pointing and kind of figure it out. And then we put a bee key at the end, hoping that maybe that would help people just to the genus level for the Eastern U.S. with some pictures again. So we'll see. I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm hopeful that it's helpful to people, but um, 
it, it's a it's a challenging book to write. Yeah, it, I, it certainly involves taking some risks, and I but I just can't. You know, I think I, I sent you some questions in advance, but I, I remember we had a, a an episode with John Asher, and he he made this bold claim that we're at a transition point. He said, you know, where were birders were in the 1970s, and if you were a scientist in 1968 looking at the bird guides, you probably say that can't be done. Or you would have some kind of like trepidation. There'd be some kind of like, uh, I don't think it's going to work, but they did. It worked and it was great. It was a good model. I guess you ha- no, what's the, no risk, no gain or what? I can't remember what the phrase is, but, but it, no, no pain, no gain. <laughs> no pain, no gain. Yeah. No, there's no pain. I'm sure the pain's already passed. It's to the press. <laughs> For better or for worse, it is. It's almost more painful waiting for people to get it and get some feedback on whether what we what we envisioned and tried to do worked out. So we'll see. We'll see. The verdict is out. So it's a hunt in the in the Eastern book is 125 bees. So if you're a listener uh, east of the Mississippi, these are the bees that you know. And I think this is a great model personally. I think for somebody who's starting out and wants to get into, you need to start with a palette of bees to kind of get the gestalt. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. And it's funny you, you say the word gestalt because um, that's such an important word when it comes to bees. That sort of repetition builds up this sense of what a bee is. The force helps you feel out what it is without you actually being able to put your finger on it. Um, I was reading I was reading the, the Key to Hylias, written by Snelling back in the 1970s the other day. And in the, the start of it, he says something about, well, after looking at a whole lot of females, I was able to sort them into subgenus based on general habitus i'm like what (laughs) what does that mean and then he follows up with something about like obviously that's not going to work in a key it's like yeah no kidding (laughs) but that's just it with bees there's so much that's that general sort of that feeling and how do you turn that into a book so we tried to do this thing where we would have a you know several pages of sort of the same bee over and over a bunch of lazioglossum dialectus a bunch of um, different anthophora species so you get a sense of feeling for what this bee is and with enough practice, the same way that you can flip through your bird guide and be like, well, I'm pretty sure it's in the flycatcher group. You can get to that section and then page through slowly. Um, That's, that's the hope. We'll see how that goes. You know, my technician, Sarah Kincaid always uh, emphasized and liked Bill Steven, uh, Torchio and Borhort because it had all those bee heads. It had an array (laughs) of bee heads lined up so that, you know, you weren't just looking at the key. You were kind of like general general characteristics um as a way to get started so so this book is is the key is kind of unlike um you know how it's traditionally done the key at the front and maybe descriptions later here it's kind of like you're like like the bird book you're flipping through the mallards that's exactly flip- right. Yeah. Oh. And we sorted it by family and the families are, I don't know, I, the short tongued and long tongued are together, but it's, you know, it doesn't matter which one came first from our point of view. It was just pu- putting things in there in, in a way that was accessible to people. So it starts with collectives and then on from there. But um, and then at the very back, there's an actual B key so you can pull through. And, and we did it in a way. So like the head characters, the thorax characters, wings characters are laid out really easily. So you can kind of you know, flip back and forth um, between the two and, and hopefully, hopefully if our key works, um, get you to the genus and, and get you, if you can't do anything else, you could get to the genus and flip to the section of the book that is that genus and figure it out. That sounds amazing. Well, here, I got a, I got a suggestion. Let's take a break and I want to, let's flip through some pages of the book so I get a sense of uh, how things are laid out. And then let's come back and let's talk about um, the details, the nitty gritty about how um, the common bees of uh, the eastern United States is going to look to somebody when they pick it up. Okay, right. We'll come back in just a second. We're back. I am delighted to have now done the very quick... (laughs) Scan of the book, and let me tell you, folks, it is amazing. Ah, and then you're too nice. So let's talk a little bit about the, you got your 125 bees, and you, you, you let's just a little bit more about how they were selected. So some of these bees, these are the bees that people are going to see, but you also talked about some bees that might be floral specialists that are kind of easily spotted if you went to that floral host. 
Yeah, so we picked bees that we thought would be in urban areas for sure. But then in addition, we we hooked up with Sam Drogi and asked him to tell us what bees he thought should be included. So he threw in his two cents on what should be in there. And then we went to Bug Guide and iNaturalist and looked for the most commonly photographed bees in those areas, because oh. obviously those are the ones that people are queuing into and might be most curious to know about. So all of that together kind of combined um, to, to figure it out. And as we were going through, you know, it occurred to us like, oh, maybe we should be including some of these bees that are specialists on on kind of rare or or seldom seen plants, because obviously whatever bees are associated with that are are likely to be or more likely to be the specialists on it. So um, as an example, there's a a plant that grows in kind of swampy, marshy areas throughout the eastern U.S. called um, hibiscus. And there's a bee that likes to nest in swampy, marshy areas called telothrix. So we included both of those. Not that telothrix is common or would be uh, seen frequently, but if you're looking at a hibiscus, there is a good chance that you're going to find a telothrix on it, and that might be kind of fun to know and figure out that feels successful. So, uh, uh, and I love that idea because it, it allow. like I can see, I, I always think that there's multiple ways that people find their entry points, and one is just kind of like seeing some bees and kind of getting, the other one is like, I'm going on an expedition. There is a bee that I read in this book that's in, I'm going to go to the swamp. And I'm going to go find this bee like that's always the treasure hunt is always great. And I love that this has opportunities for, you know, living, leaving the city limits and going on a treasure hunt. <laughs> I, I absolutely love that. I mean, I think honestly, if, if all else fails in this book and it's too hard to identify them, it, it, there's a lot of great pictures and it continues to be a celebration of bee diversity. So that's a win no matter what. Um, the, the bees are pretty and fun to look at and hopefully will encourage people to, to take a look around them and see what's there. And, and help people remember to be a little more connected with with what's going on all around them, even in urban areas. So um, we'll see. Now, when I looked at the when we we kind of quickly did a scan through the book, that I noticed it starts with a nice a kind of biology morphology section. You know, the other book, uh, Bees in Your Backyard, had some morphology, but it really kind of foregrounds it at the beginning. It's like here's what you need to here's some of the basic kind of features and structures you need to know to be able to get into this. Right. So I think one of the biggest challenges um, to bee biology, and I totally understand why, sorry, bee taxonomy, I understand why, why this is the way it is, but there are words to describe every single feature on a bee's body. And there are words to describe what kind of angle you're seeing or, you know, the relationship between two different body parts, um, all sorts of very interesting and and intricate um, details to kind of wrap your mind around. So we thought it was really important to include at the beginning a really thorough understanding of the bee body parts that you're most likely to encounter as you read through a description of a bee. And then just to reemphasize that we put a glossary at the end that also includes those so that people could look through like, what was escape again? And they can look in the glossary and find that and understand what they're reading. There's no way really around bee identification without understanding bee body parts. Parts, but um, any sort of aids and tools to help as you learn those, I thought might be a good idea. The next thing I was really delighted with is then we get past that and then we start to open up these wonderful pages that are organized by family of uh, actual species. So, you know, I'm always used to, uh, I'm not a very good tech, I'm a terrible taxonomist. I, I can barely <laughs> do the genus key, but I'm always just, um, always, I stop at genus. You know, it's like, OK, and then I don't know, you know, there's some common ones, but here it's kind of like organized by species. So you've got species pages with distributions. And I notice you have a little pic picture there with the, the actual silhouette of the bee, the kind of life's giving you a scale. It's like a bird book. You like open up and you've got your bird there. It's like a really rudimentary bird book. It's not nearly as complete, obviously, and this is the um, the main challenge for it. But yeah, we tried to find as many ways as we could to make it clear what bees you were looking at and to try and work in as many species as we could. So um, for example, reading through Agaclora, there aren't all that many species. So we just feature the one, but in the similar species section, we talk a little bit about what other, what other species of Agaclora you would see in the East and how you might be able to distinguish between them. So, um, yeah, we, tr we tried to include as many as we could while still highlighting the one that was the most common. Were there any groups that were really challenging to depict or to kind of like fit into this format that were, you know, just 
didn't didn't fit that agricola so, sounds like a, a an easy one to put in but were there some that were just really hard absolutely yeah and it's going to be even harder when we finish this western one because there's so many species that don't even really have names but are they're really common around so uh we'll we'll, we'll figure that out <laughs> um no but so lazy oglossum was definitely a little more challenging because the characters to tell them apart can be um variable and there's so many species so even if you do list five characters to distinguish between two there's probably another 10 that share similar characters as well so um we went with sort of just just a, a broad layout of a couple pages to give people a sense for the bee and the, the ones that really stood out in terms of like having a red abdomen or having really interesting tegula that people might be able to actually um, tell to species. And we try to really emphasize that if you do want to key something out all the way to species, you should probably use the key, the true taxonomic key, and we include those in the back of the book. That was really great. You, you, uh, when we flipped to the back of the book, there were pages and pages organized by family of the keys that were used to that one could actually follow up. If you wanted to take the next plunge and the next step after this book, you've got a nice reading list to kind of take you down that hole. Yeah. Yeah. It's a intense reading list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I guess, you know, I, I just circling back to this John Asher uh, kind of observation i guess you know now we uh in a couple months i guess the book will i was on amazon the other day and they said july that's right yep uh, so um the book will be available fairly soon and we'll, we'll, you know there will be a bird guide for the bees <laughs> <laughs> what do you what do you imagine is going to happen when this kind of hits the world like what do you you've seen the readership of the bees in your backyard and i have a an image of like what's going to happen but in your mind, what what happens when this book is unleashed in the world? What do you envision it being used and how do you see it being kind of like, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think there are so many ways that it could be used. It could be a nice um, door weight if you need to prop open the door. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess my hope is that it provides another way for people to connect with what's outside. And, and the, the fun thing to me about bees is that you can never look at just the bee, right? So if you've gone to the trouble to buy this book, you're clearly outside looking around a little bit. Mm -hmm. And if you see a bee, you're probably going to see the flower that it's on. So you've seen two things and you've seen the connection between them. And when you see the flower, then you see the soils that that flower's in. And, oh, I'm in, a, I'm in a swamp. Oh, my gosh. How did I end up in a swamp? And now you have another level that you've looked at and um, become even more aware. So I think I'm hoping it's a gateway to noticing more and more of the things around. Um, and I, I guess my hope is that as people become more interested and more excited, Excited and less intimidated to learn about bees, they might be willing to share more about what they've what they've seen and what they've learned. And we end up with more than just the eyes of scientists out saying, oh, it turns out Agaclora is here. It turns out, uh, you know, Anthophora occurs on this plant. And we thought it was a specialist only on this one. So through the eyes of everybody that's out looking and with our awesome phones and computers and technology and iNaturalist and whatever, um, we might learn more about bees than than we could have without the help of the people who are buying books like this. Fantastic. I, I, I'm, 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 um, I'm also just come, circling back to the doorstop question. How, how big is this book? Hopefully not too big. How many pages is it? I, um, I can't remember exactly. It is 288 pages, but it's, it's, it's little. So I guess maybe kind oh, of thick. I know they went with a thinner, it's a thinner paper. So it's not that. the same dimensions as bees in your backyard. This is like a field a pocket no. guide size. Yeah. Ooh. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. A big, big back pocket, not a small back <laughs> pocket. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that is great. I love the format. Uh, I do remember we had Dr. Chris Marshall on and his, he just remembers, you know, his journey to becoming a museum curator started with field guides, having things <laughs> curated in a way where you kind of like have the fauna or flora of the place that you're going and you pick it up, that that was an important, you know, um, point of discovery or, or a point of beginning for him for becoming a museum curator. I'm just like, yeah, there is something about just pulling everything together in a format that, um, uh, you know, anybody with uh, interest and enthusiasm can uh, embark on. It's a, it's a really important thing. 
That is, you are speaking my language. I think that's why I wrote Bees in the Backyard in the first place was just, I am a collector. And this was a fun way for me to collect all of the information. You know, now I have bee collections and all this stuff, but to pull all of those things together in this really nicely organized way with pretty pictures was very satisfying. Um, And I, I totally get it. I have so many field guides and I just... They're so nicely organized. It's really fun to look through them for that reason. And see that you, you can see the order. Like it starts to make sense why all of the holictiny are in that group together. You can see it. Um, even that gestalt shows up there. Well, what about us poor souls in the West? How, uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you will remain poor souls. <laughs> Um, it's coming. So I'm still working on writing it up. There are, there are some challenges. So one of the challenges to the Eastern guide was, um, getting my hands on specimens that we could take photographs off. Joe is phenomenal when it comes to this stuff. And he traveled to several museums and reached out to some different people, but, um, Eastern specimens were hard for us to get shipped or, or to pull from the B lab to get in, um, in for a book. The Western guy, we definitely have more than enough specimens to look at, but there's so many. The vastness of Western bees is just kind of incredible. Um, And so so we're working through that now, like how to pick out which anthophora to include. Which ones do we leave out so that, you know, and and you think about it, we really should have one just for California because it's kind of got its own fauna. I guess we do have a lovely one, but um, it's hard to include that just because there's so many bees that occur just in those regions and not further west oh, I see. in the Sonoran and Chihuahuan Desert. But when we get through all of that, it will go out to be edited by um, a couple um, bee colleagues at Princeton picks as, as peer review sort of editors, and then it'll come back and we'll make those changes and do the um, actual like grammatical edits with another person. And then finally it goes to the designer who puts it all together. We read it over one last time before it goes to print. So I think we're looking at a little over a year before that's all. Oh, I can wait a year. I've waited a year this year for everything. (laughs) (laughs) I gave a giant preface because I thought a year sounded too long, but if you're okay with it, we'll be fine. (laughs) Well, let's take a break. I'm, I'm excited. We've got this segment we do where we ask people and it's, it's really kind of like the book that asked for book recommendation and bees in your backyard is, is neck and neck with Xerxes backyard you know, gardening book. So I'm kind of curious what you're, um, I've got all sorts of questions. I've seen your, your bondolier for carrying killing jars. There's, I got a lot of questions. So everybody's like waiting for this section. It's like, oh, I got to fast forward through the music and you can do so right now because we're coming back in a sec. Okay. Okay, we're back. And um, so three things that uh, book recommendation. Do you have a a book that you would recommend that is? So, yes, (laughs) I have a book I would recommend because I think it's fabulous. It's a a rather new one. It's called The Solitary Bees. You know this one? I I think Danforth was. Yeah, I love it so much. It's like a collection but it's a collection of all of the the details, all of the the behavioral details. And I think it's a fantastic read. So that's really good. As far as the book that I use most often, I use Bees in the World almost every day. Bees of the World is definitely my go-to book for taxonomic information. But the one I'd recommend as a a nice read is definitely Solitary Bees. It's really great. I really love the way it, it, um, because there's a lot of literature coming out in the in the present, but I really love how it's, uh, it reaches back to older literature and kind of puts it in. It's like, Oh, I'm so glad. I, I really appreciate that effort. You, and yeah. And if you read, I think it's in the epilogue maybe that they talk about how they did that and why they came up with that. All of those wonderful little gems that used to be written in these like short format, little bits that they pulled together in this that would have otherwise been lost. I just think it's fabulous. Great no. suggestions. Great recommendations. So the next question I have for you, I'm curious about like what your go-to tool is. Like if you had, cause we did have a, a, a Dr. Uh, Wilson was on actually the second episode. And <laughs> I, I think we started the segment with him. He had the, uh, he has his net, which is a golf club. 
I have the same one. I got about 15 of them downstairs. <laughs> They're so great. You can't beat them. They're wonderful. How, just um, out of curiosity, how do you get a net hoop on a golf club? It's it's not as bad as you would think, but um, <laughs> okay. just to save myself the time, I actually get them from a place in Logan, Utah, that has been custom making them for the B Lab for the last like 20 years. Oh. So I just call them up, and they literally ship them down to me in New Mexico now, okay. um, every couple of years. But uh, it's not, it wouldn't actually be that bad. So you cut off the head and the it's hollow inside. So then you oh. can do the the male female um, and just weld it in there and then, and then screw on the hoop. Okay. And it's, gotcha. it's yeah. Um, my go-to tool, I know you're thinking I'm going to say the bandolier of death, but you know, <laughs> if I'm totally honest, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh, I think I would go with as, and if this counts, right. I would go with my database. I have a database now that has all of this information from the hard work that we've been doing around New Mexico that is so valuable to me and able to answer so many questions that, um, I find, I think my, my database might be the tool of choice for me right now. Well, maybe go into this a little bit more. What, this is a specimen database or what, what is this? Yeah. Yeah, so um, we've been doing a, a lot of survey work all around New Mexico for various different projects, national monuments, um, national conservation areas, rare plant studies, studies in, in little parks and stuff. And so this is actually how I spend my summers is, is um, going out and getting all of those bees. But the act of, of maintaining the information that you learn from those requires a, a, a database that's fairly well maintained that includes like floral records and dates of collection in the place and you can compare pilot and, and study it and learn so much in so many different ways that I'm kind of enamored with looking at the data right now. <laughs> is, the, uh, is this a, a database that you developed yourself or did you sort of, uh, is it a kind of adapted from another? Uh, this actually, um, my sister is a, a, she works a lot with databases. She works for a bank and I actually, um, oh. co-opted her services for a couple weekends and asked her to build me one. So this one is, um, all her creation and it's, it's kind of amazing. <laughs> you know, I, I, I guess that's the thing is like people uh, know you from the bees in your backyard, but you, I, re you know, I remember there was a paper that you and Terry Griswold put out and I was really uh, amazed by it. It had all the kind of large sample events in the United States on a map. And right. it, it was, there wasn't a lot of them. You expect the whole map to be covered, but where somebody's gone into an area and really intensively sampled the bee community and defined it. There's not a lot of those. There's really not. There's there's fewer than I wish there were, but my hope is that in the next 20 years or so, we'll fill in some of those gaps. I think that baseline data is so important as we move forward with questions about climate change, with questions about landscape level modifications that we might do, like what happens after a burn or what happens um, after a grazing or when cattle are removed or whatever. Mm -hmm. In Western landscapes, to, to understand what happens, you have to have some information before it happened. Um, and so those kind of data sets can be really, really valuable as rare as they are here in Northern New Mexico. I mean, until I started wielding my net and my bandolier of death every summer, I think most of the, the bee work in where I am and, and sort of North and East of me had been done by um, TDA cockerel back in 1906. So goodness. Yeah, it's really exciting to be adding on and finding new records and like, oh, now there's a Chacusa here that we didn't know that Chacusa went this far east or Centris or some of these other fun things. So, um, yeah, I'm very excited about that. Fantastic. Well, I, I guess it leads to the last question, which is like, you know, you, you are good at doing this now. You had to take a whole like half a continent to be and boil it down to 125. So you <laughs> will probably have no problem coming down with like your favorite. <laughs> Terrible question. I don't know why you make people come up with one. <laughs> um, I mean, it's kind of like a color. It depends on the day and my mood, but I think my go-to is the one that taught me everything. And so I have to go with Diadesia just to call out to my, my good bee, the Diadesia, who um, got me through my PhD. It's, it's a wonderful bee with a really, really cool life history. <laughs> Sorry. Are they... are are Diadesia in the east or are they just the western? <laughs> There's one species that occurs across the Midwest, but you don't find it very far <clears throat> into the east. Fantastic. Well, 
Sorry, I had to get a drink. No. <laughs> Talking about diadesia got me off. <laughs> off jokes up here. <clears throat> no, I'm kidding. Um, but your your work was in the east, right? Oh no, but you came out west to do the work. You you yeah, were. Yeah, I got my PhD, but I would drive out out to study the diadesia out here and look at the floral scent and all of that fun stuff that that diadesia do. But if you ask me again tomorrow, I'd probably give you a different bee. There's so many good ones. It's you, you shouldn't ask this of us. <laughs> I but yet I do. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Thank you so Has much. Has anyone ever oh, yeah. brought up like antho- anthophorula? Has that ever been a? I so you know I you know I'm I'm not I know <laughs> I know anthophora but anthophor what say it again? It's, it's cute. It's this tiny little thing that looks like a flying spider. That's probably a close second. Oh, cool. actually, Link brought it up the other day because they have um he. He gave a presentation where he showed the 2019 Anthophora data, and so uh, he he slipped them in. And I remember him saying something about oh. small little. They're great. Oh, good. I'm glad he brought those up. That's a good one. Well, fantastic. I am so looking forward to getting uh, like all the rest of us uh, 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 our hands on this copy. And so, thank you so much for. Um, taking time to tell us about the book and thanks so much for putting the effort uh, you and Dr. Wilson for coming up with us. Thank you. Thank you for your encouragement. <laughs> it's nice to hear that you like it before it's coming out. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. The show is produced by Quinn Sin and Neil, who's a student here at OSU in the new media communications program. And the show wouldn't even be possible without the support of the Oregon legislature the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research and Western SARE. Show notes with links mentioned on each episode are available on the website, which is at pollinationpodcast.oregonstate.edu. I also love hearing from you, and there's several ways to connect with me. The first one is you can visit the website and leave an episode-specific comment. You can suggest a future guest or topic or ask a question that could be featured in a future episode. But you can do the same things on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook by visiting the Oregon Bee Project. Thanks so much for listening and see you next week. Thank you.